Oceania was at war with Eurasia. Therefore, Oceania had always been at war with Eurasia. The enemy of the moment always represented absolute evil, and it followed that any past or future agreement with him was impossible. Those words may have been written in the 20th century, but they could have been easily have been applied to the 17th century, as we'll learn on this week's episode of the State of Greater West New York Report when we talk about the Beaver Wars. We're brought to you, as always, by... Each week, our community makes history. Each week, you make history. And each week, there's only one source to turn to for the first take on history. You know what that is? Subscribe to The Sentinel right now to discover the history being made in your own backyard. The Lennon Honey Lake Falls Lima Sentinel. More than just your news, it's your history. Welcome, everyone, to this edition of the State of Greater Western New York Report. Join us each episode as we discuss fantastic topics ranging from history to science to the strange and the wonderful, as well as the treasured spirit with which our region has infused America. We challenge you to consider all things Greater Western New York, from our region's very beginnings to how it inspires, how it empowers, and why it is so admired. Here's the host of the State of Greater Western New York Report, Chris Carosa. Hi there, and welcome everyone to this week's edition of the State of Greater Western New York Report. We're going to be talking about the Beaver Wars. You may have heard about these in high school, or maybe not, but they were actually a fairly interesting thing that, that lasted almost a century. And what were they? Why were they important to us? And how did they reveal what was going to happen next? Let's go right to the screen here and see what we've got with the Beaver Wars. It is uh, really, the, the, the interesting thing about it is, as I read at the beginning, there was a lot of similarity between what we saw in the 20th century and maybe what we saw in the 17th century. Let's go back to those words. Since about that time, war had been literally continuous, though strictly speaking, it had not always been the same war. To trace out the history of the whole period, to say who was fighting whom at any given moment, would have been utterly impossible. Since no written record and no spoken word ever made mention of any other alignment than the existing one. If you don't recognize it, that's from George Orwell in his classic dystopian novel, 1984. But they could have easily been to the pre-Columbian cultures in and around the greater Western New York region. With the advent of European colonization, this never-ending warfare came to a climax in the 1600s and culminated in the nearly century-long Beaver Wars. Who knows how far past the wars had gone. Competing tribes really were going head-to-head -head long before the Europeans first set foot on the North American continent. We do know they reach back to at least the 15th century, probably before, but what we know about goes reaches back to the 15th century. Why do we know that? Well, during his multiple expeditions in the 1530s, French explorer Jacques Cartier first came upon the St. Lawrence Iroquois. Why do we call them that? Because they lived along the St. Lawrence River. Now, while his first voyage, voyage explored the Gulf of St. Lawrence, it's Cartier's second voyage that took him well down the St. Lawrence River. There he made contact with two prominent St. Lawrence Iroquoian settlements. In July of 1534, and again on a second expedition a year later, he met this apparently unaligned tribe at their village of Stadacona. Stadacona was at war with the nearby Totemen, likely the, the Mi'kmaq tribe. Donacana, the village chief, showed Cartier five enemy scalps taken from the, an attack that previous spring. So they'd already been, already been at war by the time the Europeans had showed up. On October 3rd, 1535, Cartier visited the St. Lawrence Iroquois' vibrant village of Hokulaga. So impressed, Cartier wrote of this future site of Montreal, and here within the countryside is situated and sits the said town of Hokalaga, 
near an adjoining a mountain that is around it, plowed and very fertile, from a top of which you can see very far. So Cartier knew that this was a significant piece of real estate. Oddly enough, uh, when Samuel de Champlain led an expedition to this very same region 75 years later in 1608-1609, the St. Lawrence Ara Iroquois had vanished. There was no trace of their villages. The reason for their disappearance remains subject to much speculation today. War with neighboring tribes remains a leading candidate, but most likely with the Mohawk to the south, possibly with the Huron to the west, or both. Note, this occurred before the beginning of the so-called Beaver Wars. Why is it called the Beaver Wars? Well, though originally it looked for uh, a fabled Northwest patches, the, the French, they quickly found riches could be had in what? The fur trade. They turned their attention towards establishing New France, a series of forts, settlements, and trading posts meant to acquire mainly beaver pelts from indigenous tribes for resale in Europe. Following Henry Hudson's return to Holland with a boatload of furs in 1609, the Dutch did the same thing. While France settled the St. Lawrence watershed, the Dutch created their own New Netherland up along the Hudson River, as well as the Connecticut and Delaware Rivers. There, they established a thriving fur trading business. The British came relatively late in the game. They, in the, for the most part, they prioritized creating sustainable colonies, not merely trading posts and forts. But that didn't mean that they didn't have a stake in the fur trade. It was just that the French and the Dutch had geographical advantages over the British, as we'll see in a moment. So now we have the table set. When we come back, we'll start with the first course, a first course which uh, you may find quite delicious if you're a history buff. We'll be back after this message. Through the mists of time, nature and man have both created and buried treasures beyond the imagination. With the ages, these riches slowly dissolve into mere myths until they are forever forgotten. But there are those brave souls who tirelessly cling to the truth, ever seeking to discover the undiscovered, to reveal what has always been there, to uncover the hidden gems of a land thought forsaken, but loved by millions. Fifty Hidden Gems of Greater Western New York. Discover the secrets in your own backyard. Buy your copy now at 50hiddengems.com. Well, welcome back. You're watching the State of Greater Western New York Report, and this week we're talking about the Beaver Wars. Yes, those series of battles that occurred in the 1600s and really shaped the future, the geopolitical future of our immediate region. We we, as I said, we set the table. We initially we set the table. Let's let's kind of get into the, a little bit more detail there. All right. So I'm going to go slower than I did in the beginning here because there's a lot of data that we're going to cover. And it, it really first starts with the idea that the Beaver Wars really were mostly involving the pre-Columbian cultures. They lasted through the 17th century. That these cultures actually fought for control of the fur trade. The wars began in the Northeast before spreading to the entire Great Lakes region. Who did they involve? Well, that's, that's the question of the day, isn't it? And you're going to be surprised when you see exactly how this lays out. It starts really with the Mohawks, Oneida, Seneca, Onondaga, and Cayuga on one side. Up against them, Huron, Algonquin, Susquehannock, 
Erie, Neutral, Petun, or the Tobacco Tribe, Odawa, Ijobiwi, Renro, Mohican, or Mohican, spelled both ways, Inu, and Abakami, Abenaki, I should say. The Beaver Wars, they, they really included all these tribes. But you know what? They're not just called the Beaver Wars. They're also called the Iroquois Wars because the Iroquois Confederacy, also known as the Five Nations, stood alone against all these other tribes. All right, <laughs> there's a little bit more to it than this. The Europeans actually supported different sides. The, the Dutch and later the English would support the Iroquois Confederacy. The French supported those fighting against the Five Nations. The Beaver Wars, therefore, were also known as the French and Iroquois Wars, as we'll find out again later when we see what's going on exactly between these competing interests. Finally, it looks like the Iroquois Confederacy was vastly outnumbered. I mean, look at the numbers, 4,500 to more than 20,000. However, it was the liberal trading policy of the Dutch that gave the Five Nations a remarkable advantage that more than made up for the difference in numbers. <laughs> but first, the Iroquois were on the opposite side of that advantage. Let's go back to Champlain. He, he was de dispatched by France to beef up the, Fr French's, uh, the French fur trading operations. When he came to America to do more than just strengthen New France, in his own words, Champlain said, I had come with no other intention than to make war. It seems that the Iroquois had been disrupting the, French's, the French Algonquin allies, their ability to gather those valuable furs that the French wanted. So the allies, the Algonquin and, and really Huron and several others, really reached out to the French and they said, hey, uh, you know, uh, we're having a problem here. Can you help us out? So Champlain made a lot, he had made these alliances with the Huron and the Algonquin and the other tribes living in the area of the St. Lawrence River. He agreed to help them in their war against the Iroquois Confederacy. So he seized the initiative and marched with nine French soldiers and 300 natives to explore what was then known as the Riviere de Iroquois. Today we call it the Richelieu River. In doing so, he became the first European to map the lake that now bears his name. Along the way, they saw no warriors of the Five Nations. So a lot of his men and the Indians with him headed back. That left Champlain with only two Frenchmen and 60 natives. And of course, that's when they met up with the Iroquois. On July 30th, 1609, likely near what is today Fort Ticonderoga, Champlain and his small party met up with and battled more than 250 Mohawks. So again, he was outnumbered just like the Iroquois would be outnumbered later on. But what did Champlain have to equalize things? Well, he used his arquebus, which I'll get to in a moment, but that's basically a rifle. And he, he said that he killed two of the three enemy chiefs in one shot. The third chief was taken out by another Frenchman. But essentially, this uh, really startled the the Iroquois and they'd never seen this before and they retreated it was a it was a decisive victory on the part of the French and the same thing really happened a year later on June 19 1610 Champagne Champlain led a victorious campaign against the Mohawk in the Battle of Sorel the muskets proved too much for the warriors of the Iroquois Confederacy so the French and their allies annihilated Really, two really big victories right off the bat. Technically, are these part of the Beaver Wars? Uh, it depends on who you ask, because we're really, well, maybe it should be, I guess, but we'll see later on uh, what they say is the start. But let's talk more about this arquebus. It proved to be an effective weapon in the French wars against the Iroquois Confederacy. So effective, the French made a policy not to trade these weapons 
for furs. Now, they might give them away as gifts if the Indians had become Christianized, but they made it a policy not to trade it with the Indians. Now, interestingly enough, five years later, October 10th, 1615, Champlain had less su success attacking a heavily fortified Onondaga stockade. In fact, he was wounded by arrows that struck his leg and knee, and he was forced to retreat. 1615. What could have been different besides the arrows that the Iroquois might have possessed by that time? Well, for this, we have to go back to the Dutch themselves. The Dutch had established their trading posts along the Hudson River. They had no qualms about trading firearms to the Iroquois Confederacy. This gave the Five Nations a decided advantage when attacking other tribes. The weapon superiority more than offset the often smaller-sized armies of the Iroquois Confederacy. Armed with these muskets in 1628, the Iroquois routed the Mohicans, sending them to the east of the Hudson River. You can see this circular area where they used to uh, inhabit was west of the West uh, Hudson River. Well, the Iroquois pushed them back. And that, what that did is it effectively captured a monopoly of the Dutch fur trade on behalf of the Iroquois. So no more middlemen for the Iroquois. The Iroquois were actually pretty smart businessmen. They wanted to sell direct, buy direct, and, and if anything, they wanted to be a middleman. They didn't want anybody else to be a middleman. Okay, well, we had a problem. This, was, this business was getting too good. It was so good that they basically hunted out all the beaver. You know, so this is a simple supply and demand situation. Demand accelerated. Everybody in Europe wanted these furs. So there was more hunting. And by 1640, the beaver had been, for the most part, hunted out of existence in the, existence in the Hudson Valley. That's the part where the Mohawk control. So the hunting grounds shifted from the Iroquois territory to other tribal regions in the north and west, mostly towards Canada. And there was no way to sugarcoat what happened next, whether to settle old scores, because remember, they'd been fighting with these people for a while, or just to capture the greater part of the beaver trade, the Iroquois Confederacy soon embarked on a campaign of conquest. And conquer they did. Now fully armed with Dutch muskets, the Iroquois Confederacy went on a rampage. Some historians call it a genocide, but it was a form of warfare practiced at that time, and really well before that time, by all cultures across the world. If you had an enemy, you literally pushed them off the map. You wanted to get rid of them once and forever. The, Wen the Wenro were the first to fall. After losing their alliance with the Erie and the Neutrals, not quite sure why, by 1643, the Wenro were quickly uh, wiped out. They succumbed to the decisive attacks on the part of the Five Nations. Uh, France kind of saw the writing on the wall, and they attempted to broker a peace. Uh, and it lasted for a while, and it looked like it actually might stick. But, you know, this is, again, what did the French give the Iroquois? The, they gave the Iroquois direct access to selling their furs. So the French are driving or riding, you know, paddling a canoe with a bunch of furs to trade with the French. They get there and the French say, oh, no, no, no. You've got to sell your furs to the Huron first, and then the Huron will sell it to us. Well, the Iroquois felt that the French reneged on their promise and the wars resumed, this time with quite a vengeance. The Huron themselves were dispersed following the Iroquois attacks of 1649. And by disperse, that's a word that, that uh, historians or anthropologists use that says that the group is kind of really literally pushed off the map. They're, they're gone. They don't live where they used to live. No survivors, nobody there. So, so they were dispersed in 16, uh, really 1650 is the start of the dispersal. Uh, next, uh, the, the Iroquois Confederacy raided and destroyed the villages of the Putan, the, the tobacco people. Yeah, it was warm enough back then where we could grow tobacco in these parts. And in fact, some of these uh, tobacco growers were in Western New York. Uh, so it, it, uh, 
and it sounds funny because you don't use you're not used to seeing tobacco being a product of our region but it was so the Putan were destroyed and uh, they left the scene a lot of times what happens when the Indians left the scene is they would be absorbed by other tribes including the Iroquois themselves the the neutral nation ended in 1651 and anthropologist Mary Jex said that during this final Iroquois onslaught the neutral fled into the woods and dispersed for the last time the years of famine and disease no doubt contributed to the route so these indians or these tribes or these nations that the iroquois were attacking they probably weren't as strong as they used to be which made it easier for the iroquois to to overrun them finally the erie they they were they're there on the west coast of lake erie they kind of saw the writing on the wall and they tried to preemptively attack well they did preemptively attack the seneca in 1653 and did well initially but with no other nearby enemies to contend with the entirety of the iroquois confederacy entered the fray in 1654. still it took two years for the five nations to destroy the erie and even then it wasn't until 18 or 1680 that the last renegade wandering Erie tribe surrendered. So these, these guys were tenacious. And in fact, there's still stories that there's a lost tribe out there somewhere of Erie that, that's wandering around that were never that never surrendered to the Seneca. Now what the Seneca did, the Onondaga were involved in this battle too, but the Seneca were right next to them. So the Seneca adopted an entire Erie village. So rather than raise it, they kept it, but they just said, okay, you're Seneca now. And the, the Erie there agreed to that. The other villages, uh, they burned to the ground. Again, that was just standard warfare back then. Uh, I don't know that you necessarily want to call it genocide. They, it, was a, it was a typical war. I don't know that there was any sort of uh, prejudice against one culture or another. <clears throat> In fact, they the fact that the Erie... The Eries were adopted into the Seneca tribe, and, and all the Iroquois uh, tribes uh, would adopt survivors often. They would adopt survivors from any of their conquests. So that's not usually some sort of ethnic cleansing when you do that. So in a little more than a decade, a sort of blitzkrieg for the era. I mean, I know it sounds kind of slow, but back then it was really fast. So you could call it kind of like a blitzkrieg. The uh, Iroquois Confederacy had destroyed or dispersed all of their ancient enemies. In doing so, they reigned over the greater Western New York region and beyond, as a matter of fact. But they weren't done yet. Uh, you know, I'm going to highlight two battles with the French. So the, the Iroquois had this on-again, off-again relationship with the French. They, they wanted to trade with the French. They definitely wanted to trade with the Dutch and later on the English. Uh, so they wanted to work one party against the other. So they wanted to keep these avenues of trade open. But, you know, it just, uh, the French uh, and the, the Iroquois, there was animosity, really dating back to Champlain, just picking off all these chiefs in 1609. So these two battles, they're going to give you a, a sense of both the ferocity and the wiliness of the Iroquois Confederacy. Let's start with the first one. So this occurred for five days in the May in May of 19, in 1660. Well, what happened is that it was the French thought that the Iroquois were on the march to come up and you know destroy what was ultimately going to become Montreal. So they sent a, a small group down to sort of ambush uh, the Iroquois, and when they did, and they saw these really undefended Iroquois canoes coming up the Ottawa River, uh, the French and their allies attacked them. Hey, that's great. That's good. Well, you know, there were a lot more Iroquois. <laughs> and so the French and their allies had to kind of fall back into an old Algonquin fort along the Ottawa River. And this fort was actually, the, the Algonquins planted trees in a circle. The trees grew naturally. And then they kind of cut off the tops of the trees. So you had this natural palisade of, of what was living trees 
And that was what the French used to defend themselves. And it worked pretty good. Uh, they, the Iroquois, attacked three times. So there, there were three different assaults that the Iroquois made. And the, the, the French were led by this guy named Adam Delard Gays on Mo. And he was only 24 years old. And he was the leader of this group. And what did the French have? They had lots of rifles and they put them to good use. So what the Iroquois did on the fourth, before the fourth assault, is they fashioned these sort of shields made out of trees. And, you know, they, they actually, they, they would have holes in them, but they would stop the musket balls. So on that fourth assault, the muskets didn't work like they were working before. And the Iroquois breached the walls, flooded the fort. There were no survivors. And what the Iroquois did to the bodies, as reported by, by people, basically, uh, <laughs> we can't talk about that during the lunch hour. The Battle of Long Sioux, which is what this is called, would be remembered as the French Canadians' Alamo. So the same sort of thing happened. It did actually prevent the Iroquois from moving forward into Montreal. And that, so it was deemed a success in that, although there's always some question whether or not they wanted really to go there, but that's a lot of revisionist history. Uh, the way the story was originally told is that it was successful in keeping the attacking tribe back. So that was a French defeat that was sort of billed as a victory. Uh, let's look at it from the other way around. Uh, in fact, turn about in a way is fair play, both ways, by the way, both ways, because this is the same kind of story, except the roles are reversed. Here we're in 1687, and what you see here is a picture of Cody Acton, or at least what they think is Cody Acton, in the town of Menden uh, in Monroe County. Uh, the Marquis de Donneville landed in Rondequoit Bay in 1687. He marched down into the Seneca village located in present-day Victor and Menden, and that's Ontario and Monroe counties, respectively. There they raised Ganondag, Ganondag, I can't say, Ganondagadagan and Todi Acton. Uh, or actually, did the Seneca beat them to the punch? The only actual skirmish that occurred was really soon after uh, Denonville had landed. He was ambushed by a group of, of uh, Seneca staved it off but it really it did enough damage to make him think should he turn back or not and not only that but his soldiers were getting sick uh, but they decided to move on and the, the Seneca had put some people out there in the fields to make it look like these villages were still extant but when he when he got to the villages uh, Denonville discovered they were ghost towns no one was there the Seneca had escaped deep into the wood and you know they they did they kind of they lost the battle but they won so this is what i mean by them being a little bit wily well by the early 1700s the iroquois confederacy had reached its territorial peak but the prowess in battle that they had exhibited would be called upon once again so what was that well, we're going to have to save that for another day. We've kind of reached the end of our little uh, talk today. But thanks for listening. Uh, I'm sorry if you had any questions. That I hope that I answered any of them in the discussion that we had. And uh, again, we'll be back next week with more about history, I think. We've got a guest scheduled to talk more about the Iroquois and their beginnings. So we're going to see what's going on there. If you want to be a part of the studio audience, it's free. All you need to do is go to stateofgreaterwesternyork.com and you can be a part of our live audience. It's free to register and you'll get a free invitation with the link to watch this show live. It airs every Thursday at noon. So you could ask your questions directly to whoever the speaker has to be, happens to be. If you work, you can't watch it, don't worry. It is, the show is archived on our website, stateofgreaterwestnewyork.com, and you can watch it or rewatch it there. Or what you can do is you can like our Facebook page or subscribe to our YouTube channel, 
The show is rebroadcast every Sunday at 1.30, and those platforms will notify you when the broadcast starts. So that's it for this week. Thank you all for being here, and we'll see you again soon.